Hello, I'm Professor Lou. Welcome to our live stream. I'm joined today with our prof teaching artist, Alex Rowe. And today we are announcing the December Art Dare, which asks you to illustrate an idiom. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. We are gonna get started with this children's book that I grew up with. I owned it. It was one of those children's books that was just falling apart. The pages were ripped and the binding was a mess because I read it so much. And it's one of those books that's just deeply ingrained in my head. I feel that I know every illustration by heart. And Alex, you know this book too. How did you get introduced to this book? I spent so much time as a kid uh, at the library where I grew up in the kids section, just reading all of the children's books. And this one, I remember it from the shelves. I remember flipping through it and having a lot of fun with it. It reminds me a lot of that uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs book. Just the whimsy in the pictures. Yeah, and I actually remember as a kid not understanding half the <laughs> idioms. There's one later on in the stream, the drink is on the house. I did not get what it was. And so it's funny how you read it differently as an adult. Tell us in the chat if you guys grew up with children's books in that way, because they have a profound impact on you at that early age. So Alex, why don't you explain this idiom? Because some of the idioms are easy to understand and some of them are really mysterious. Yeah, this one took me honestly a hot minute to review and understand it. And then when it clicked, it was just this great aha moment of a fork in a road. Uh, and I love it. And I think that this book is going to be a really interesting first step in exploring this art dare and how to think creatively about it, where keeping your intent in mind of how you want the image to look and the audience you want, but not being so quick and literal as to just simply draw a fork in the road. Erica is saying, I have been recommended this live stream for so long leading up till now. I am dying to know, is the thumbnail a quote, army coat? It is not. It's supposed to be a coat of arms, <laughs> which if you guys don't know is like a shield with your family symbols and stuff. But in the thumbnail, it's a bunch of arms that create a coat. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at some other examples because beyond the Fred Gwynn book, we were able to find a huge range of different ways to interpret idioms. So we have contemporary illustrators, we have images that are more graphic and more cartoony. So can you explain, Alex, what is the black sheep in the family? What does that idiom mean? The black sheep typically means the outsider in the group. Um, specifically in a family, kind of the that classic image we can all think of that cute family portrait with everyone wearing sweater vests and then like the one punk kid with a pink mohawk, that black sheep image. And then it also can apply in a non-familial setting of just the person who's walking to the beat of their own drum just doesn't necessarily fit in. And the cool thing about illustrating this image is you can in explore the positive or negative connotations of being a black sheep. Is it good to be a black sheep or is it bad? That's going to be a fun one that you guys can work on exploring as you're thinking concepts. I don't know about you, Alex, but I'm definitely the black sheep in my oh, yeah. family. <laughs> I'm the one who causes trouble, which is why in some ways I feel like this illustration doesn't really embody the idiom very much because the black sheep looks nice and kind and it's a different color, but I don't know that I see the characteristics of a black sheep that I might expect to see. So that's something for you guys to think about is how literal are you mm -hmm. going to be with this? So Alex, how about this image by George Cruikshank? Uh, this one is the great idiom a lot of us in America use of raining cats and dogs, which I don't, nobody takes it literally, but the icon imagery of cats and dogs falling from the sky is so synonymous with the heavy rainfall or a great substantial storm. And this is one that is a challenging one for depicting because it's so often 
used and so clearly in everyone's head that depicting it in a creative and interesting way is quite a challenge. I mean, this image is from 1820. So this idiom has been through the ringer as far as use and public viewing goes. And I think another thing to think about, so Neil here is asking, so are we supposed to make literal illustrations of idioms? Not necessarily. In mm -hmm. fact, we would really push you guys to go beyond the first impression. So you get past those cliches because we've talked about in past dreams about art cliches and how they're good for a quick read, but they don't get you to think as carefully about what's going on. Alex, how about this one, ducks in a line? What do you think about this interpretation? I think this one is a really interesting way to apply it literally, but also hint at the subtext meaning of the idiom. So always the phrase of like, get all your ducks in a row, ducks in a line, is just kind of be organized, arrange things, coordinate them, execute it well. And in this one, not only are there literal ducks in a line, it's organized well. It's a very clean, precise image. And I love how the coordination of the rainbow, the Roiji Biv color scheme is part of the organization of these ducks. So I actually did like this image is very simple in visuals, very graphic, but I love that kind of double meaning that is going on in it of both literal and conceptual. And I do think that you can figure out whatever style you want. I feel like these illustrations by Miki Sato, they're on the subtle side. They're not loud, confrontational mm -hmm. images. They take a minute to figure out. And this one has a decorative element to it with the lace and all of the patterning in the background. This is on the other side of the spectrum. This is clearly a cartoon. It's very graphic. It also incorporates text. What do you think about the text here, Alex? Uh, I think that the text is uh, unnecessary. I think when you think of the most basic meaning of an illustration, it's that an illustration is an image meant to convey an idea or a message. So by incorporating text with it, it is a little bit superfluous. It doesn't need to be there. Raindrops is saying illustrating idioms helps us remember most of them just by looking at them rather than memorizing all of them. Yeah, it's sort of like we used to make up silly things in art history to help us remember things. <laughs> there was this one pyramid, it was called a ziggurat. And we always used to say zig er ot because it was from the city of Ur. So it's sort of like that, these little silly things that help you remember what is going on. All right, what about this one, Alex? This one, I love it, uh, barking up the wrong tree. And I think the thing I love most about this is that while still illustrative and illustrating an idiom, it's more on the fine art side. It's more contemporary. It's not quite as standard as a childish or children's book illustration of an idiom, which I think is the most common representation of this form of illustration. This one's allowing it to get a little bit more darker and a little bit more, I think, contemporary in its characterization. Well, and I also think for this idiom, barking up the wrong tree, you think, okay, we're gonna have a dog, we're gonna have a tree, right? Mm -hmm. But I love how this illustrator puts another figure in the other tree behind the dog. And so that's this indication that, oh, the dog is maybe trying to find <laughs> this creature on the right, but he's clearly, <laughs> in the wrong place. So that's where other things like the environment, other characters can really come into play. And mm -hmm. this one is really mysterious. Like, I don't know that a lot of people would pick up on bird brain right away. What do you think? I agree. It's something that I didn't really get until reading the title of it. Um, I actually don't mind that though, especially considering like when you think of say the cool is a cucumber image or a piece of cake. It was, ta-da, I did a picture of a piece of cake. And it represents a piece of cake. <laughs> Whereas this one is more of this creature it's implied that it has a bird brain, but it's kind of focusing on this character. And I enjoy how 
much it stretches the intent of the idiom, how much it kind of pushes outside the box of what am I representing here, rather than the most straightforward answer. We have a comment from Karen who says, Bruegel has a painting full of Dutch idioms. That is really cool. I need to look that up. And by the way, you don't have to do an American idiom. There's probably so many from different cultures and languages that I would be so excited to hear about. So definitely don't feel that you need to limit yourself to the ones that we're showing or the ones that are familiar in America, because some of them are really bizarre. <laughs> you sort of wonder like, where did that come from? So I mm -hmm. feel that a lot of this art dare is not just the illustration side of it, but doing the research and that we can help each other learn about new idioms that maybe we didn't know about before. So that will be really fun. Yeah, like Maria Kilson is saying, as a non-native English speaker, this looks like a great way to research idioms. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What about the text here, Alex? <laughs> it's so funny because I can't remember the last time I was told to put a sock in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's we all still get what it means. And it's such a funny, literal depiction of it. And I think it raises an interesting point that Maria was mentioning about research of either researching an idiom you don't know or diving into the history of an idiom you do know. Like now I'm curious, this is from World War II. Was this the first use of put a sock in it? How far does that <laughs> illustration go? Like, <laughs> or sorry, how far does that idiom and that concept go? Well, that George Cruikshank one that we saw of the raining cats and dogs, that's from the 19th century. How mm -hmm. cool is that? I mean, there's probably idioms that have been around forever and ever. And I'm sure there are ones that maybe just came up in the last few decades. So definitely do that research. And here's another one. I mean, it's so dated looking, the graphic design, yeah. you look at the font and I don't know, like at first I was like, what's on the, oh, it's a keyhole. <laughs> it took me a minute, what about you? Yeah, it's also, um, I think it's an example where sometimes a very direct, straightforward visual approach can be supplemented by an interesting graphic design. Like compare this one again to the cool as a cucumber where the text was just simply there. This one, there's work being put into the typography and incorporating it with the image. So yes, it is very dated because it is from World War II era, but do you see how this image while being straightforward is still kind of a visually interesting one? Well, what I like about it is the bend of mm -hmm. the text, a key to victory. And then you'll notice that the hand is pointing downwards at the lips. And so that just naturally leads you towards the destination, which is of course the lock and the key. So I think that's a fun compositional element. This is such a beautiful, mysterious illustration. What do you think is going on here, Alex? Yeah, well, so it's the idiom inner child. And I think it's such a powerful way to look at it of a child just kind of patiently waiting and again, this is another one where I have to do a shout out that it is a little bit more on a fine arts side. It's a little bit more, I could see this image in a gallery setting much more so than in a children's book or in a magazine. And that's a cool thing about it that I love that challenge they're applying to it. But it's a very evocative image, despite being just so straightforward of it's a child and a heart, period. It's eye catching and it's emotionally effective. Well, I think a lot of people, their take on find your inner child is, oh, be fun, be playful and whimsical, you know, all the things that adults are not. And so the first impression is, oh, I need to show somebody dancing around and being happy. And that's what it should be. That's the first interpretation. But the mm -hmm. thing is, find your inner child is being interpreted in a more serious way. I think part of it is that it's a silhouette of a child, but it's ghostly. It's a little bit ethereal and dark, and it's not a heart like an icon. It's a mm -hmm. real anatomical heart with veins and cadmium red and valves, and it's such a different way to look at it. So your choice of how you represent those images. I, he didn't have to do a ghost-like silhouette. He could have just illustrated a kid, but yeah. the silhouette definitely changes the way you see that. 
Alex, can you explain what hungry eyes means for people that don't know this idiom? Yeah, and the meaning behind hungry eyes is directly related to what I like about this illustration, where the common conceptual meaning of hungry eyes is typically in like a lustful manner, in ogling or gazing at something you desire. Whereas in this one, they're choosing to take the idiom extremely literally. And that's a funny one as far as how to choose to visualize it. Where in this case, visualizing it extremely literally is creating an image that none of us have seen before. I have never seen this weird concept of a bunch of eyes eating sandwiches. And in that way, ignoring the concept that we use the idiom for, and instead focusing on just the words used, can make some very strange and surreal imagery. There's no specific expectation in terms of how you guys illustrate. You could go the full out little route. You could make something a lot more mysterious like those Paul Barnes illustrations. And I guess just ask yourself, what is my approach? Do I want to just make some weird, wacky illustration that makes no sense like eyeballs eating sandwiches? Or do I really want the illustration to truly convey what that idiom actually means, because this doesn't really illustrate hungry eyes. Hungry eyes is like me and Benedict or something like that. You know, this does not represent that at all. So it's up to you guys. Yeah, and we got a good con uh, comment from C. Cantrell that says, I think a few English idioms have come from Shakespeare. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I remember in my high school English class, my teacher had a poster of all of the idioms and phrases that Shakespeare invented. And so that's a cool one where in exploring the history of some of these idioms, you might in that case find a whole different narrative or view of that idiom, which could be an interesting way to illustrate or convey that. Okay, so we have this idiom, which is playing with fire. And if you guys don't know what that means, it's basically when you do something that's risky, something that could get you into trouble of some sorts. And again, this is another take where it doesn't really show what the idiom means. What do you think about this image, Alex? It's kind of funny to look at because it's very dangerous, the concept of both literally playing with fire and the idiom term. It's that risky behavior. And that's why this one kind of makes me chuckle in that it's non-risky behavior. It looks to me like a kid doing the safest activity a kid could possibly do with his imaginary friend who is a ball of fire. Like it brings to mind Calcifer from Howl's Moving Castle. And it's, it's curious to me because of that blatant disregard for the meaning of the idiom and the danger of literally playing with fire. It kind of has a almost dark, uh, morbid humor to it coupled with this very safe and whimsical, childish imagery. And I think other things to consider too is how specific do you get with the imagery? For example, if you guys look at the blocks that they're playing with, my kids had so many blocks, like more blocks than we knew <laughs> what to do. And they did not look like this. They were scuffed up. They were all different shapes and sizes, different colors. And who gives a kid four blocks to play with? Come on, you, you get, if you have a set of blocks, you're gonna have more than that. <laughs> and so to think about how specific do you get, the kid is wearing clothing, but actually the part of the clothing that I like the most are the striped socks. I think that's yeah. such a nice little element that is not the main point of the illustration. It just fills things in a little bit better. How about eye candy? Let's talk about what that means first, Alex. I can be very similar to the Hungry Eyes one. And for the same reason, I find it clever that it's ignoring the cultural concept of it and just going with, hey, what if it was eyeballs in a gumball machine? Now, at that point, it is still a little bit, it kind of went one step forward, not two, if that makes sense. It decided to, oh, let's go super literal and then just stopped there. So I don't find it very exciting, but it's such a simple and effective image. And it's a really, at that face value, a creative way to explore this idiom. Yeah, so consider and do some research. Like actually, I think a good way to get started, just Google eye candy to mm -hmm. see what pops up, okay? Probably most likely you'll see examples of that, which for a lot of people, 
eye candy usually refers to an image that's really pretty and really fun to look at, but maybe doesn't have a lot of depth to it. Maybe it doesn't get you to think very much. For me, a lot of the artwork on the internet is eye candy because most of the time on Instagram, that's what does well. People are excited by eye candy. It's easy. You don't have to think that hard. And so for a lot of people, that's something that's entertaining. Vincent says, makes me so happy that you use the king who reigned. I honestly never met anyone who was familiar with it that I knew of. I may actually still have my copy somewhere. If I have my copy, it's in like tatters. It's probably like rags. <laughs> Did you ever have books like that, Alex, that were just dead? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was actually a collection of Batman comics that my dad grew up with. And then his kids then grew up with. And it was just completely demolished and it, it was actually very satisfying years later my brother and i found a copy of it at a library and so we could finally read the ending that we had previously eaten or damaged with play-doh <laughs> oh you never saw the last page no the last page was missing <laughs> oh my gosh that's hilarious i mean i definitely have books like that that have like disintegrated and my kids can't really read them very well but it's mm -hmm. sort of a moment from your childhood, I suppose. Okay, Alex, what does smell a rat mean? Smell a rat is referring to a kind of suspicious feeling. It's most often used, I think, in old black and white gangster movies of like, hey, some, we smell a rat, you know, there's something fishy going on, which is another idiom, <laughs> but something about suspicion. I'm sorry, I'm just having a funny moment here and recognizing how many idioms we just use without thinking about them. But smell a rat, in this one, it's conveyed very literally, but still conveying that message of something suspicious is going on. Um, I just want to point out this comment from Dara, who says, it'll be fun to see the international idioms from all the international folks here. Yeah, we have a huge mm -hmm. audience from all over the world. And I actually think a great way to start, in addition to doing Google image searches, is hang out with us in the Discord because we have a whole channel just for the art dares. And I think it'd be fun for us to just make a group list <clears throat> of all these different types of idioms and maybe everybody can share what that idiom means because you can read an idiom that's from another country, but I really feel like you need somebody to explain the context for you. Because for example, there's a saying in Taiwanese, which means you ate too much. And what it means is that you're such a spoiled brat <laughs> because you've got too much to eat that you end up doing really stupid things. You end up worrying about things that don't matter. And I feel like that that's such a Taiwanese thing because people take food so seriously. And if you don't understand that context, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, what is smoking up, Alex? So smoking up refers to the act of engaging in the activity of smoking. So in this one, the image is fairly literal, but it's taking this wonderful, fascinating, fantastic element to it. And it kind of has that cool fairy tale realm in incorporating such a rather boring and straightforward idiom. Ray Mayo says that rat thing is from Hamlet. Oh. I didn't know that. I guess I have not read all my Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Dara says these idiom illustrations shouldn't be more than rated G, right? Well, if you want to post them in the Discord, we do have rules about what's involved. Just keep in mind, you guys, that we have a really broad audience. We have kids who are 15, 13 that follow us. So if it's not allowed in the Discord, it's probably not allowed on social media. If you're not sure, you guys can always ask us in the general channel in Discord. One of the mods will definitely help you guys out. Snackalope says, quote, not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> what? <laughs> what the heck does that mean? <laughs> my mom that says that awesome. all the time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Emil is saying, is it okay to use idioms from other languages too? Absolutely. We would mm -hmm. love to see that. What would be nice, you guys, maybe give us the idiom in the original language and then give us the English translation because I love just seeing the language, even if I have no idea what it means. Yeah. 
There was one. Okay, so I Alex and I are going to do a very brief brainstorming session to give you guys some ideas for how to do this. So Alex, the drink is on the house. What are two images that come to mind with this idiom right away? Right away, you just, you have to have a house and you have to have a drink of some kind. Okay, so there we go. We got a drink, mm -hmm. we have a house. Don't stop there though, okay? <laughs> because if you stop there, you're not gonna have a lot to explore. So for example, I think what helps is to break down the individual factors. So for example, the drink. Does it have to be a boring blue cup? Could be a beer, bubble tea. <laughs> you can also do sake. It's such a different image depending on the type of drink because drinks have personality, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, and this is that way to take it beyond that first level of image making and explore noticing how when you change whatever the drink is, that changes the connotation broadly. And we'll see that further as we incorporate changes in the house as well. If you the have way. a house that's run down, mm -hmm. totally different situation. I mean, it almost makes the martini glass look really, really out of place. And so you have this bizarre contrast. Castle, I mean, a castle's a whole, who are you, Alex, if you live in a castle? Yeah, like royalty. And it makes me think in those two images of a dilapidated house or a castle or a mansion, you have kind of two ways to look at that idiom, either positive or negative. The positive one of the castle, the drink is on the house, this is free. And it's usually that favor given to someone who you respect or you like. And that has that sense of royalty, of luxury, of like, ah, like I'm the king of my castle, this drink is on the house. Whereas the other one, the dilapidated house could be painting images of like the harmful concepts of alcohol and drinking and the long-term effects. So do you see how even changing that one imagery widely changes the tone of your image? And sometimes it would not make any sense. Like yeah. why would you put a martini <laughs> with a cl classical Greek column? Like to me, that makes no sense at all. So sometimes just running through a lot of different options it can really influence the outcome. Positioning, why does this matter, Alex? I would say it matters for twofold. One being the more obvious for us in our audience is composition. And this is where thumbnails come in and how you're gonna convey this image. But the second one is again with relating the concept of the Im image. Like looking at all of these, seeing how the tone changes depending on how the drink is arranged how when it was upside down, it almost looked like a part of the roof of the house. Think of how that kind of changes your meaning and where you're going with this. And then you can mess with the house. So what happens when the house is flipped over, Alex, to the image? That instantly conveys to me a sense of almost being beaten down by this <laughs> martini glass that it, it <laughs> had tackled the house and is standing on top of it, has conquered over it which is a very, I think it's an intentionally challenging meaning to the traditional concept of this idiom. Love this comment from Shay Goon, who says, I'm 14 and I'm learning so much from you guys. That is so wonderful to hear. So glad you can join us. And was it a cat I saw says, if the drink is on a castle, it's no longer a house and loses the meaning. Well, what do you think about that comment, Alex? Because true castle does not literally mean house what do you think about like stretching those words like how much is too much and what yeah i think that's exactly and you started to mention this with the coliseum where in brainstorming like this and in formulating your ideas you will hit a point where it all of a sudden doesn't make sense anymore where you went from the drink is on the house to a very basic idea of a drink on a house and then you maybe dug too deep in the wrong direction. You're like, wait, all of a sudden I have a cup of tea on the top tower of a castle and I'm completely <laughs> lost. <laughs> and that's the kind of beauty of brainstorming and that fun of this kind of sandbox play that creative brainstorming can lead you down. I love this from 10,000 Crows. That house is drunk. It needs to go home. <laughs> that's great because you're really personifying the house in a way that we weren't anticipating before. And it goes with what the idiom is about. And just to piggyback on top of what Alex is saying about the house and the castle, I do think in brainstorming, 
you have to come up with wacky stuff like that. You have to come up with ideas that don't work, make no sense, and that you're not going to use. You, you can't just limit yourself to, oh, well, I'm not going to bother drawing that because I'm not sure that's going to work out. Just explore it. It's fine to do that. Mm -hmm. Got a great comment from Neil about how can we translate foreign idioms? I'm trying to do it right now in my head, and it sounds weird. And I think that a lot of the times they typically do. It's idioms are almost, I heard somewhere that idioms are the height of language comprehension, where it's not just taking things literally, but also examining the culture behind it. And it makes me think of a Spanish idiom where essentially the English equivalent would be making a mountain out of a molehill. But in Spanish, translating it to English, it is essentially saying to cover up the sun with your thumb, which is such a beautiful and yet new image for that same conveyed message. Let's talk about scale the relationship between the individual objects. So here we have a house that looks pretty big, but the thing is a martini glass is small compared to mm -hmm. a house. So actually this is kind of a big <laughs> martini glass or a fairly small house, but look at what happens when you do this. How does this change the relationship, Alex? Like wildly in, I think when people think of characters in illustration, they think of, um, beings with a conscience or living characters, but characters and illustrations can be non-living objects or things, just things to focus the eye on. And it's going back to the whole ancient history, hieratic scale and examining the importance of them. And it's funny when you're looking at the small drink on the house and it being very close to normal size, that makes me think of even if you do something so straightforward like that, I think of a very Wes Anderson image. Picture a beautiful color palette, a beautiful painted image of a home with just a cup of coffee on the roof. So weird and surreal and David Lynchy <laughs> that it's not exactly unique as far as exploring the idiom, but it's a very successful image. So don't let your, if you don't have like a knock it out of the park concept for it, that doesn't mean that you'll have a bad image. We have a question from Neil who says, but how can we translate foreign idioms? This is what we mentioned earlier, but I wanna show this follow-up, which is from W315, who says there's usually an idiom in the other language that kind of means the same, even if it's not a literal word for word translation. For example, I'm not even gonna try with this language. A cat's jump is similar to in America, we have just a stone's throw. So maybe those of you guys who speak multiple languages can help us out in that area. Okay, now another thing to think about is place. So what happened now that there's a cloud <laughs> in this image, Alex? <laughs> it's incorporating a sense of setting. And again, looking back through this slide when you guys can review it later on after uh, the stream goes live, seeing some of those images that were just straightforward and simple, like the cool cucumber, no background, it was just there. And then the other ones like barking up the wrong tree where there's a whole sense of space, a sense of atmosphere created. And that's that way where, whether it directly relates to the idiom or not, the inclusion of a background in an element can be a way to incorporate your own individual style and complete your creative goals. For sure, so those of you guys who are asking the Discord, what do I do now with the background that the whole face is wonderful and awesome? You guys can't do that, okay? Brainstorm the background. Don't have it be something that you tack on at the last minute. Because Alex, if this house is in the clouds, what's going on with gravity here? Oh yeah, it changes the whole thing. It changes the framework I'm looking at it, where all of a sudden to me visually, a drink being on top of a house is the least bizarre thing going on. <laughs> so it completely changes the image making. And that's stressing that point that the background cannot be something that you leave until the last minute. And then think about this. There's variations in the background. Maybe it's not just a cloudy day. Maybe it's raining or... Maybe there's a thunderstorm. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> if you guys just run through all the things we talked about, scale, placement, background, 
even the type of house, the type of drink, that's a lot of factors to go through. And so what I would recommend you guys, when you're doing the brainstorming, put it on paper. Don't run it through your head. Alex, why do you think putting it on paper is important? Two reasons. One is our memories are a lot weaker than we think they are. I'll get so many good painting ideas that are forever lost because I'll have those ideas when walking the dog and think, oh, that would be fun. And then I keep walking, I pick up some dog poop, and then I get home and the idea is completely gone. So record it. And also visually putting it down helps me to turn a good idea into what could be a good final product. Where in my head, it's just complete, it's done, and it's ready. But by actually formally sketching it, I think of all of the nuts and bolts of, well, okay, what colors do I want to use? How big do I want this to be? What composition do I want to have? And sketching it really helps you start to iron those out and establish if this idea can really hold water. Great comment from Was It A Cat says, where language is limited in translation, art has the potential to be more universally understood. Very cool. Hello, I'm from Earth says, what is the art dare I understand? I don't understand that much about it. Well, we're gonna get into that right now. It's basically a monthly art challenge where you guys have the entire month to work on it and the deadline is the last day of the month. So we also have this extra thing. For those of you guys who want a little bit more of a more substantial challenge and it's called the Art Dare Leap. So this is if you wanna do more. Now to officially enter, you just have to make one piece. That will get you into the Art Dare as an entry, but I know some of you guys are very productive. So the Art Dare Leap is going to be to choose an idiom for that week, but to illustrate it in two different ways. Why is this a cool challenge, Alex? I'm so excited by this one because all throughout the stream, we were talking about the multiple ways you could approach one idiom, and this gives you a chance to do all of them. Do you want to convey it whimsically, like for a child audience, or do you want to convey it more seriously, more brooding for maybe a more mature audience? Do you want to take it very literally, or do you want to invoke more of the concept behind the idiom? Do you want to examine the history or how it's most often used today? And by tackling the same idiom twice, you can really explore and have fun with the different ways you want to convey that image. All right, so to get information on the guidelines, you wanna to go to artprof.org, you wanna click on Art Dares in the main menu. That is gonna take you to the main Art Dares page and to get to this month's Art Dare, you're gonna scroll down and you're gonna see there's a little thumbnail that takes you to the December Art Dare. You click on that, that will take you to the December Art Dare page. And if you scroll down, you guys will see there's a lot of information. Now there are two ways you could submit, okay? If you are not on social media, we do have an upload form, which is this red button, and you guys can do that. However, we do strongly prefer that you guys enter on Instagram. It's just easier for us to keep track of everything, the form is really simple. You just fill out a couple things, you upload your images, but we much prefer this. Make sure you guys tag us and that you use hashtag artprofdare. Instagram actually just recently in the US, they turned off the ability to search recent hashtags. So you guys tagging us is extra important. So that way we don't miss your submission. And then at the end of the month, next month, we will actually go through all the entries and we always do a video where we feature nine or 10 artists. We look at your entries and then we also have prizes. So we usually award an honorable mention. You can get my book, you can get access to the voice channel and the discord. This is cool guys. If I were you, I would totally pick this prize, which is Kat's middle school comic book. And when I say middle school, I mean, as in she drew it when she was in middle school. And it's like this thick. And if you look at it, it's it's hilarious. I would definitely <laughs> pick this if I were you guys. And then for the prize winners, we do have the offer to do a portfolio critique, website, Instagram critique, or longer term access to the Discord voice channel. Our prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Alex and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord, please join us in the post live streams channel. 
If you're not in the Discord, shame on you because you should be there. It's the coolest place on the planet, on the internet. Invite link is in the video description below. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who give us the support we need to keep Art Prof 100% free and accessible to everybody. And everybody, thank you so much for watching. Good luck with the art there. We can't wait to see.